and welcome to my uh, colleague Simon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've actually, um, for those that uh, know anything about SQL Server, um, you might have heard of me or read, read, read my blog and you've hopefully seen something in SQL Server 2012, but this webcast really isn't for those people, it's for people like Simon. And that's why I'm here, isn't it? <laughs> Ask some silly questions about SQL Server 2012 and to try and tease out you just some of that technical detail which you sometimes uh, take a little bit for granted. Absolutely. So he's going to be here keeping me honest, so let's get stuck in. Um, this webcast is specifically looking at the database features of SQL Server 2012. Uh, we've got another one in a couple of weeks' time, I think, Sarah, so, where we're going to have a look at the business intelligence elements. And, and often in releases of SQL Server, we find that somehow business intelligence takes center stage. It's nice to actually step away from that, although I spent 10 years doing it, so I love talking about it. Step away from that and look at the database uh, in the round, in, in the general capabilities that it's got. Now, SQL Server 2012 is a pretty important release. There's a lot going on, um, and a lot of that is actually in the database space, space, so it's quite good to be able to cover some of that off. So let's get started. Now, I'm sorry for two fronts. First of all, this is kind of the marketing slide, and secondly, it's got the word cloud written on here quite a lot, which I know um, absolutely delights many of you. Um, but kind of get used to it. Think of it as a super optimized data center. I think I always like to, to think of running a cloud as being able to run um, for a small service, but at a much more scale with more capacity automation with things just running. I don't think anybody out there is having less service to run than they were in the past, and particularly uh, in the case of databases we're seeing um, all around as well. Absolutely. Databases and database applications are everywhere. If you probably had a look around on your own uh, desktop machine, you're listening to on this, you'll probably find SQL Server actually installed on there, even if it's only keeping track of your media files. So the databases are everywhere. The number of database administrators isn't going up. We're not having enough kids uh, for the next generation of DBAs. And then yet our databases um, and the size of those databases are increasing in size all the time. So we need better tools and a better version of SQL Server just to keep up with all, all of this change that's going on. Plus, of course, we're dealing with different kinds of data and a whole, whole load of, of that as well. So when we look at when we look at um, the development of SQL Server 2012, there are three things here that were in the minds of the people writing the code. What can we do to make SQL Server 2012 better, apart from what's not the customer shouting at, saying what they'd like to change? We do, of course, listen to that too. And I think a lot of people um, are probably using some of the elements, for example, um, a SQL Server high availability portfolio to make their, their SQL Server more available, to cope better with disasters, and that kind of thing. But it was difficult to kind of know which one to use. Mm -hmm. and they didn't all really fit together very, very well. We're going to go into that in a bit more detail shortly. The, the middle pillar, Breakthrough Insight, is what I'm going to cover in the next webcast with further knowledge. And Cloud on Your Terms is really recognizing that you know, SQL Server is just one part of an application, a uh, service, typically these days. Take SharePoint, for example, where we have a web front end, we have a middle tier, and then we have a database back end. It's understanding that fits within that role, and that not, not everybody is a database based administrator. People like Simon have many years' experience, but still terrified of the damn thing. Yeah, I absolutely will not go anywhere <laughs> near any, uh, any <laughs> lines of SQL at all. He just, he just sends me. So we have a lot of organizations where there's a part-time DJ, so you're just maybe touching on your lives. And we want to be able to make sure that SQL Server can, can kind of survive in the wild, where there isn't that full-time professional out there. And you also get your data from anywhere. So let's go into these in a bit more detail now we've got over that. So if we get into um, the business of high availability, the required nines, five nine high availability. And, and there's a couple of companies I talk to, and EasyJet's a good example of this. Their internet order, um, the internet site where you go and book tickets, like, you know, you, you hit easyjet.com and you say, I want to fly to Malaga this weekend for 50p. Then that's all backed by SQL Server. And that SQL Server environment hasn't been down for three years. And what's interesting about that was not that they have an army of people that have got one full-time DBA. It's also the fact that they've actually upgraded from SQL Server 2005 to 2008 R2 without bringing that environment down. So without any downtime at all, they've been mm -hmm. able to move and get all the data over without having to take anything down, without having to take the customer facing website down. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, some, I mean, peak time, say in January, when we're trying to get away to that winter break, for example, they can take a million pounds in six minutes. They can fill an aircraft in, in sometimes 20 seconds from the, from the flights coming online. So really, really important to that massive business. So a very small IT department punching above its weight in a big shed. 
in a big shed next to a runway. Next to, well, it's not so far from the runway. And actually, what they've done now is they've moved their data right away from that runway because one of the things we can now do is easily move data up onto ANSI and back again if we need to. So if the data center goes out, that can be your DL solution for it, potentially. You know, critical data can be kept somewhere else, like on our data centers, which, which are pretty good in mm -hmm. Okay, so the key word probably in here, if I was going to pick one, one, one phrase actually out of this, is, is availability, is always on. Um, and specifically the availability groups that are within that. So we're going to dig into this a little bit more detail now. So if I was going to pick out one important thing for me on there, it would be running uh, my SQL Server instance on top of Windows Server Core. And the reason for that is, as a DBA, I don't have to be thinking too much about running the operating system, so why don't I take that out of the equation? But also, and the fact that it runs on server core adds security into my entire infrastructure. It does. Um, but Simon, you've made a bit of an assumption here, Jack. Okay. Do you think most of the DBAs and people on this call know what server core actually is? Well, that's a good call. So server core is actually um, a copy of Windows Server, which is running without a uh, UI on it. You literally have just a command prompt. You have access to um, PowerShell if you'd like that, and you have access to a cut down um, version of um, a kind of command line um, scripting function. At least you do in Service 2008 R2. With Windows Server 2012, which was actually released to manufacturing uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was actually on general availability last week, we actually have a new, much more usable way of working with um, Windows Server in a cut down, more secure way called MinShell. And that actually gives us a certain amount of um, that graphical functionality that would be much more familiar to, say, DBAs mm -hmm. or managing a Yeah, because I'd be interested to know, and it would be great to put a poll up here, how many people know how to install SQL Server from the command line, as opposed to going through the UI and hitting the check boxes. Because that's fun to do for a couple of times, but particularly when I'm standing up demo environments. You know what? I just need a SQL Server environment with a database installed and reporting services, maybe, and that's all I need. I know how to do that. And so I just, I just execute, I execute that. And, and maybe uh, in, in the cloud world, we also have this concept, and I don't think we're covering it too much in this because it's already in there, of being able to prepare um, an installation of SQL Server and then being able to sysprep that machine, bring it out of sysprep and complete the SQL Server installation. So we can have a templated machine, particularly in the world of virtualization, where we can um, have that template part there and say, yep, I'll have a couple of those things, and we fill in the blanks and our virtual machine is good to go. We, we can give it the name, uh, we, can, we can say what domain it's in, and credentials, and all that so on so forth as part of the post installation procedure, but the media is already there. So SysPrep is supported here as well, so that's important for the cloud too. It is, and it's, uh, you're absolutely right, it's absolutely critical for that, because if you are going to need to um, just spin up um, 10 instances of SQL Server on separate servers very quickly, you need to have all of that pre-configured, pre-installed, and just ready to go. You want to be bringing down your total time of getting from um, zero to actually having a running server. And the only way to do that is to script your way through it. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's have a little bit look. Uh, sorry, I'll just read that again. <laughs> let's have a quick look now at um, the specifics of uh, this new HA environment. So we've got failover clustering. We've always had failover clustering in, in SQL Server back in the days of uh, SQL Server 2000. But that required a sort of 20 page manual you to have two servers that more or less rolled off the production line, one behind the other, so that we could quickly move the, uh, the database running, the running, the instance running the database over from one to another. And it was tricky to set up, partly, I guess, because the DBA hasn't got visibility of all of it. You know, the, 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 the um, infrastructure guys can set the trust truck and then we're going to drop the SQL Server on top of it. And patch, doing rolling patches and so on and so forth got, uh, got quite difficult. We flirted with the idea of patching the whole cluster and we've reverted back to actually the old way of doing it in 2008 uh, R2. So the one key thing here I want you to notice is the differences on the right hand side here. So when we use clustering, the databases don't have to be in full recovery mode. Now I'm not sure, I presume you're listening to a global knowledge um, webcast because maybe you don't know everything there is to know about SQL Server and that full recovery thing may well mean something a little bit different. So to me where I saw um, full recovery mode, I was thinking that that was akin to um, putting Active Directory into Active Directory restore mode, whereby we have to do authoritative restores and that kind of thing. Um, but obviously that's not really the case with SQL Server. No, what, what full recovery means is that we're tracking absolutely everything that's done, every transaction that hits the database is individually locked. We can have bulk lock mode, and that would allow you, if you were ramming in a whole table's worth of data, to just keep that as one transaction. But then we lose sight of what the individual rows going in. So if you want to replay that, that becomes quite difficult 
to replay. In the clustering environment, it doesn't matter so much. Either that's gone in or that hasn't, and, that, and that's absolutely fine. But when we talk about the new availability groups, these are fantastic. If we, if we look at, just to pull back out of this a minute, if we look at what's different about um, mirroring and clustering and, the, and, and, and um, log shipping, which are kind of, I guess, the three um, solutions you've had up to now, clustering allows you to protect a whole installation SQL server. So if that whole thing falls out, all the databases start running on another node on your server. Mirroring, on the other hand, takes a full copy of the database and has it running somewhere. Only one, mm -hmm. but it's an individual database. Where in clustering, we have shared storage. So actually, some people use combine both of these. So they might use clustering, and then they might mirror key databases to another site, slightly tracking behind the updates going on the live environment. Mm -hmm. Because if it all goes horribly wrong on the live cluster, you've got no other copy to roll back too quickly. So you might have a, a, a mirror that's play an hour behind, and you've got that. 55 minutes to go and undo the fact that I just deleted something I didn't mean to. It strikes me as well that mirroring is probably slightly different to clustering in that clustering is very well suited for everything being together on the same site. Mm. And I presume that mirroring works um, better over a wider distance connection. You, you can do in the higher end editions of uh, SQL Server. You can have uh, what's called asynchronous mode, which means that we aren't. Um, when, when you update a row in a SQL Server database, we basically say, yeah, it's done and it's fine. We kind of come back to you. It's a bit like taking money out of your bank account and giving it to Sarah over here. It only arrives in Sarah's bank account once it's gone through yours. You can't end up with a halfway house. We have this atomic transaction thing in, inside there. So what happens in the mirroring environment? It has to arrive on the mirror before we say it's actually committed. Right. And if we roll back, it's fine. But that takes time. You've got to wait for the other the mirror server to work. And the mirror can actually take longer and work harder than the, what's called the principal, the main database, to do all that work. So we have asynchronous mode, but we don't care. We just keep updating our database, and the, the, the mirror of the wet piece of string down a broadband line, or whatever it is, um, is trying to keep up as best as it can. But we don't know where it is. It's continually coming up. All those transactions can, uh, can be encrypted, but definitely compressed as well. So that's really good. But you can only do one database, and you can only have one mirror. Availability groups take the best at clustering. So we, we want to be able to protect six databases. You know, SharePoint is a good example. SharePoint reads databases, and System Center does too. Um, like you know, I like I, I work get through SOS. So there are just lots and lots of databases. And for that whole environment, we need all of them. So we create something called what's called here an availability group. We put all our databases in that availability group, and then that availability group is either running on one copy of the databases or the other. Okay. The second thing is we can have multiple secondaries. Some secondaries can be synchronous and really near us. We can fail over to them and we know they're OK. And other ones down a wet piece of string can be at remote site. So it, it, it would make sense to me with the, with a bit of an efficiency hat on. If we've got all these secondary, secondary databases out there mm -hmm. around our various sites, let's say I have my, um, my main um, warehouse operation running out of London. But actually, I had a load of guys who are over in, say, Hyderabad. Mm. And they're doing lots and lots of um, BI queries against my mm. database. I could put a secondary over into Hyderabad where they are, yeah. and presumably they could do all of their read intensive operations against that secondary. And that would be efficient because they wouldn't be running them against my um, master copy that's back in London. You can read them as well. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what you can do. And so we, where, where um, the mirror in a, in a mirroring in an older version of SQL Server, you could kind of make a snapshot of it and you could kind of do some read only operations on it. That's just in the box. Okay. So, there's, there's all sorts of um, opportunities here. As you can see, we've got a DR uh, replica, can be an active secondary. We do have to use this full recovery mode. Though. So let's just go through some of the implications of what we've just been discussing. And you've got this slide deck you can download afterwards to people. Um, so you can look through this, and there are notes at the bottom of the page to augment what you can see on the slide. As you can tell, we're not reading our slides because we have been on a presentation course. So, uh, you can, but there's some important numbers in here. For example, you can only have, you have four secondaries, okay, and that's what we've just tested to limit to the moment. Two synchronous secondaries, so two places, continue trying to keep up to date with what the primary is doing. Where did we get this idea? I wonder. We had this idea of a database, and then there's two copies that are sitting somewhere else. On where do you think we got the idea for that from? Um, off the back of a pack packet? No, SQL Ansi. Uh -huh. Does exactly uh -huh. that. Yeah, so this is what we basically, when we talk about this as a database for the cloud, it's because this expertise and this coding has actually come out of our experience of running 
databases with, for the Azure service. Now, I appreciate not everybody on this call is suddenly going to want to embrace the cloud. They're going to want databases running in their own data centers, and that's why we have DBAs and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, this idea of talking about cloud ready, this kind of idea of, of providing this kind of failover capability is exactly how we do this stuff. And you can see several of the features that are mirroring in later versions of the SQL Server, like also page repair and all that being baked into it. So we've kind of come up with this hybrid availability solution, which I think is, um, you know, it could be the single reason many people want to update to SQL Server 2012. It's also a doddle to set up. You do not need to be a rocket scientist. Yes, you're going to need some credentials to talk to your infrastructure manager. And it can work with a cluster or not, as the case may be. You don't have to have shared storage. If you've got it, you can use it. So you can combine it with clustering if you want to. And we've seen this very similar technology coming out in Windows Server. And we will um, hopefully be asked back by general knowledge if, uh, if you want us to come and talk about what you can do with Windows Server as well. I must also apologize for these strange noises in the background. Um, there's a guy outside our window who's just decided to turn on some very loud thing. It's not your headphones. Please do not adjust your set uh, as this noise comes and goes. So let's have a look and see how this kind of works. We've got server A, server B, server C, server C, each with two databases on. And we've got those two, um, two databases in the little box there. Clearly what we want to happen. And does this work if I hit the arrow here, sir? I'm hoping it does. Yes, it is. Server A, guys we actually use the copies on server B. They don't move, it's actually using the copies that are already on server B. Because we essentially have a, a live copy of that database everywhere at the same time. Yeah. Now what we have as well as part of this environment is we have a listener, which is a, a DNS entry um, with, a, with a pointer to where these databases are. So that anything connecting, it's trying to connect the SQL Server, whatever technology we use, will look at that entry and say, yeah, I want to connect to my SQL Server environment. Mm -hmm. And then it connects to that thing. So, um, and, and that's going to happen seamlessly, okay, and very, very quickly as well. So we don't have to do anything, and it just it fails over yet. Yeah? So this is this is um, making the point here that we are using failover clustering, mm -hmm. but we're not using shared storage. Sorry, what I should have said earlier. Yes, it uses failover clustering, but it doesn't use shared storage. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever gone onto a server and tried to build your own cluster. But actually, it's a, it's a couple of lines of PowerShell. But pretty much all you say is, like, I've got these, say, we've got three laptops sitting on my desk here. Um, laptop one, laptop two, laptop three. Please join the cluster. This laptop done. Um, and that's all you need to do. And then what happens is you would go into um, the service, the secret service running, the service manager, um, not, not in services, but actually the secret server service. And then you would actually see the name of that cluster. You'd restart the SQL Server instance and say, hey, look, it's on a cluster. We do a normal installation of SQL Server on each of these boxes. Then we start again. You set the cluster up. You've installed full stack ordinary installation of SQL Server, hopefully the command line, because you're now fed up of installing it again and again from the flaming UI. So I'm not using the word flaming. No swearing on webcast. Top tip, anyway, for anyone doing webcast. Um, and then what we do is we put so SQL Server on there, then we, we tell the SQL Server service about the cluster and say we want to use always on. Mm -hmm. And then we get some new tools in uh, Server Manager to show us how to uh, play with that and create these availability groups, a logical group in databases and create an availability group on that, on, on those servers and that's ready to move around. We can also specify, because obviously there might be an initial copy and to your Hydrofab example is a good point, you might want to send Hydrofab a copy of your database rather than waiting for the web data screen to update because it could take to now from month to Sunday. So the changes can be quite small. So let me just see if I understand that right. In order to be able to set up an availability cluster with this architecture, you um, install Windows Server onto three servers. Mm -hmm. You then install SQL Server onto three servers. Yeah. And I presume that my database is that's on just one of those servers. And you've got copies on each one. Yeah. Okay, so I, yeah. yeah. And then um, I create a cluster in Windows cluster mm -hmm. between the two. And I tell SQL Server about that cluster, and it will then replicate the database around mm -hmm. each node. Yeah, you can copy it. You can copy up the initial replication. This is very much the way that you see, use it, uh, uh, where the listeners are familiar with um, mirroring. This is what you do. You could you could have sent the database over and store a backup to it, or you can let actually let the um, uh, the network do it yeah. for you if if you've got bandwidth. Okay. So if I if I'm short on bandwidth, I give somebody a USB key, slide them over to my remote site, and they get set up. Yeah. So that's that. I just think is awesome. We've got a few more slides here. Um, 
just to show, to make the point here that we've got primary and secondary, we've got better, you know, how much better it all is, and so on. So you can put some of these slides under your manager's nose if you're thinking of um, having a go yourself. Obviously, it's really easy to set up um, a sandbox for this, and we'll come back to that that thing later on in later on in this presentation. You also get a nice shiny management dashboard telling you it's all healthy, which is important too, particularly if that part-time person, you know, who's or maybe you know um, the senior DBA, you know, what's actually had a holiday and. Uh, it's good to know when he's not there that all, all is well. I didn't think DBAs were around all Well, you know, that's what I got out of it. Anyway, um, Simon's point here, the always on active secondary, means that we can actually we can make full backups, not differential backups. We can make full backups of a remote site. If you think about that, you've now actually got a remote backup capability of your database just by virtue of having this technology. So if it all goes probably wrong, you can fail over to your DR site and you've got backup as well. And, and all that good stuff. Because back, there's still no substitute for making backups. Even if you've got copies of these databases and all that, you still should be making proper backups. Not this which won't pass the exams. Which is, don't, don't do that. Uh, and you maybe need to be looking for another job. Uh, so this is just explaining how this works. This is making the point here that we can run reports off the secondaries, which is really useful as well. Because that, that's a, when people say to me, how do we improve the performance of the OLTP, the online transaction processing side of SQL Server, how we make it run faster? Well, if we're not doing things on our main database server that's processing orders, like running silly reports, mm -hmm. then that database server clearly is going to run faster. Okay. Sorry. But it can still fail over and be the primary. Okay. And this is just a quick animation that you can run through to see that we're now running the reports around the other way if we wish to. So that's probably enough. Just dive back a minute. That's probably enough of the, um, the exciting world of high availability because we've used that quite a lot of time on that. But it's such an important feature. I thought it was important to, to cover off. I now want to move on to something completely different. I kind of gave the game away because I hit the hit the button too quickly. This is column sort indexing. Normally in a database, we take a bunch of pages and uh, if you mentioned we've got an Excel spreadsheet, something mm -hmm. it's easy to explain this to you. And we might take rows to one fifth rows 1 to 50, all the columns, and put them on a disk in a what's called a page. And then rows 50 to 100 go on another page and so on and so forth. Searching through that can be slow, so you then have in indexes to make it really fast to find out all the people, say, who live in Wokingham, mm -hmm. or all the people affected by noisy neighbours. Like we are on this call at the moment. So, Column store index it takes that concept and turns it on its head. What it does is it creates an index based on the column. So if we take our example of our spreadsheet again, column A might have all our dates of birth in it. Okay? Now if we think that we've got all of the um, population of the United Kingdom, say so in, in work, 48 million, um, 48 odd million people. Well, how many different dates of birth are there? Well, I figured out that there are, um, a hundred, we might live to the age of 100 on average. There are 365-ish days in a year, so I think that ends up with 36,500 possible dates of birth in my database. That's a lot lower than 48 million, and that gives us an opportunity to massively compress that data. And if we think about gender, how many different genders have we got? Then we've got uh, things like postcodes and so on, so we can compress individual columns of data far more efficiently than going across a row, because a, a date of birth has got nothing in common with an address or agenda, very different kinds of data. So although we had page compression inside earlier versions of the SQL Server, this index gives us a massive uh, massive performance. We can look up a date of birth really quickly by going down that list. We can compress it really well, and finally we throw it into memory. I'm, I'm guessing that you're all wondering what the catch is and why didn't anybody think of this before. Well, there are columns or database products out there um, from some of our competitors. But what we're able to do here is have this sitting inside the database for use in ordinary database queries, it just works seamlessly. The downside is that this database, once you put this kind of index on the table, it's read only. So the only way to change it is to drop the, drop the index, re update the table, and then put the index back on. And the index creation process, I will not kid you, could be a non trivial task mm -hmm. that you want to do um, out of hours. The database can be online, but you, you, you can't use this table. So you might, for example, say, over knowledge, and they've got this whole catalogue of Courses that you can go on. And there's a formal process to launch a course. So actually, we don't need to do that online. We can take that course database offline at night, update the new courses that we're going to offer. And now, we're, now we've got new certifications coming out in Windows Server 2012. Did I mention that? Uh, 
And so you can then, and then update the table. And all the time it's online, we can have this column based index. And anybody, any application looking up that course, rocket fast. Let's look at how fast fast is. So this is how it works. And here's a typical query. We've got 1.44 billion rows in a, in a particular database. We've also got a warehouse table with 20 rows in. That's where our warehouses are. Uh, maybe it might be the global knowledge training centers in my case. And we've got 73,000 rows of dates of training courses, say, in our, in our training database. So we can run this query against that stuff, like on the left-hand side here, uh, on a machine with um, 80 cores, 256 gigs of memory, and 10 gigabits per second network. And what would the answer be? Well, the answer would be um, that normally this would take um, 259 seconds. If you turn on column four, it's going to take 19 seconds. That's a massive example. Now, once that stuff is in, in buffer and memory, um, the, the time it takes goes up. Actually, and I think these figures are wrong. I think the warm buffer pool number here is actually wrong. I would expect to see that. I've seen the test where it's actually dropped to two or three seconds. And so we can see massive amounts of time that it takes to um, get these queries out the door. Okay, and you're going to get concurrency out of that as well. Because obviously, once that once that um, that table is indexed is in memory, then everybody's going to get that benefit. You might think that those numbers are really large. Bear in mind that you know as we move into the world of Windows Server 2012, mm -hmm. we can give 64 cores to a virtual machine, and so you could have this kind of performance inside a virtual machine as well. Absolutely, and we've already proved that um, some conferences recently that we're seeing, um, in terms of the IO ports, seeing a million IOPS inside of that mm -hmm. virtual machine on that kind of infrastructure. So actually, a, a good place to be. Yeah. So thank you very much. Right. So moving swiftly on to the business about talking about clouds, and I am going to keep coming on and talking about that. Uh, we've improved the way audit works inside. Um, SQL Server, which is uh, really good because it's now basically in all editions. You get a low level audit, you get better tooling in enterprise. We recognize that everybody's going to need to see what's been going on in their database in such a way that we can see who's been looking at the database as well as who's been in changing. The other thing um, I think is um, really important in here is the second one down on the left hand side, contained database authentication. Let me just translate this in, into English. I pick up a database and I stick it on another server. Mm -hmm. The logins traditionally for SQL Server, whether they're Windows logins or SQL Server logins, are sat in separate database. So in the world of mirroring back in the day, if you're running 2008 R2 today, you end up with um, a situation where you also need to think about moving all the rest of the database across to another environment. Containing database security means that all the logins, all the login information about that database sit inside that database so you can lift it and shift it as an atomic unit, knowing that you've got everything. It's just a simple change, but we have that now. Yeah, I can And again, you can kind of see our, our um, Azure heritage being there. That's very important. We move, you know, the server failed over. We need to move it around quickly, uncouple it from its instance, and so on. Absolutely, particularly if you're living in a multi-tenant environment, mm -hmm. and you do have your um, SQL Server hosted by somebody. Yeah. That ability is going to be incredibly useful. Yeah. Okay, so there's some other minor details there. Just some things we should go and have a look at on knowledge articles here. Obviously, we could be here all day talking about some of this feature. It sounds like you probably need a week long course in order to be able to understand that. Yeah, this yeah, that does the yeah. course. No, no, very strange. <laughs> um, okay, there may be a few developers on the call. I'm not sure if there are, but I'm going for this anyway. And even if you aren't developers, this is kind of cool. We have now got the SQL Server development, uh, SQL Server data tools. And what this is, is a, a set of tools that you just bolt into your existing Visual Studio. We've always provided a Visual Studio shell. One of the problems with that is that a developer might, for example, be developing on, say, Visual Studio 2008 and it's working on the SQL Server 2005 database or whatever, and they've got mm -hmm. different versions of the shell, and so it gets a bit awkward. So now you drop the tools onto the current Visual Studio. Now, obviously, it's only come out for Visual Studio 2010, SQL Server 2012, but already we're seeing that Visual Studio 2012 is imminently shipping, and the same approach will now apply going forward. Okay, so well, imminently shipping, do you mean? Um, Oh yeah, exactly. That's, right. that's right. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, I, I, I did know that. I really ought to read my emails. Thank you, Simon. And also means you're just opening one kind of product. I think one thing that people forget about SQL Server is it's pretty open. I don't think there are many databases where you can say, you know, I'm just going to hook up some Ruby code to my SQL Server database or PHP or Java. They tend to think SQL Server, Microsoft, .NET, done. We've got really good drivers. PHP drivers being a good case in point. So that you can um, 
start to think about moving the database on uh, onto this. And um, I kind of guess, why would you do that? Well, if I go on to, and, and this is also a, a plug for getting trained, actually. If you go on to, say, like a Monster or a Total Job site, one of those kind of sites where you're looking for an extra room, go and see how many IT jobs are advertised today. Right? Query number one. Let's say that returns a thousand hits. A thousand jobs advertised on that site. That is 19 in the UK. Now filter by SQL Server. Turn on open quotes, SQL space, server close quotes. I reckon you're going to see 12 to 13 percent of jobs mentioning SQL Server as a skill. So if you are in an organization deploying SQL Server, you know you've got a huge ecosystem of people who understand this out there at some level. Obviously, you're going to want to interview that. And equally, if you're thinking about maybe cross training, then you could do work in different SQL Server. It's the market leading database. It doesn't show up in Oracle statistics very well because they charge more for their databases. They make more revenue. So they would say they have a bigger market share by revenue. But if you actually look at what's actually deployed in the wild out there and what's actually being used, everybody's got SQL Server, pretty much. So it's really good to be able to um, plug into that ecosystem. There's a raft of books you can buy, training courses you can go on and get certified. Absolutely. I mean, if you just take a look at, um, at our standard offering, so if you look at, um, say, something like System Center, mm. in order to deploy System Center at scale, you're going to need a few SQL databases yeah. deployed in order to be able to actually complete the installation for us. It's always been that way, which I think is one of the reasons why SQL skills are in such high demand. Yeah. But we both know that there are SQL skills, and there are SQL skills. Yeah. And so if you are a DBA and you're already um, fully trained, and you're thinking, well, hang on, there's more people coming into the market with um, mm. SQL skills. Remember, being a real expert in SQL server can send you in very, very good stead. Yeah, absolutely right. Anyway, so uh, you can see here we can either develop inside Visual Studio or not, as the case may be, with these tools, um, depending on what you want to do. We've got tools like schema comparing it. It's really good the way this works. And there are other windows in here where you can you can see the changes you're making to your database in terms of SQL script they generate, um, and as well as being able to um, sort of compare production with test very quickly. And then you can actually deploy to that as well if you want to. So download that. The tools are free. Um, we've got a bunch of new T-SQL in here. I'm going to skip over this because you can just look this up on the deck either. Simplified paging essentially means that we can, when we return a row set, we can go to a particular part of that row set very quickly. You know, the row 1005, and if we know the order by clause, that can be quite useful just to return a small set of data. You can see these kind of constructs being needed in um, in reports and so on and so forth. You know, as we, as we keep the page through things. Um, support for UTF-16, it's fairly self-explanatory. And uh, sequences, we have got sequences. So um, anybody who's familiar with other database products might have been wondering where this was in SQL Server. Well, all I can tell you is here now. Uh, the essential business of being able to um, have a master sequence list stored in SQL Server that you can call row, num row numbers off of IDs off of as you need to without using GUI, for example, something that's quite good. And it's anti-standard. And that's maybe the clue in the answer there. Obviously, as anti-standards evolve, then SQL Server is tracking, but then obviously, Individual database vendors also have a value add on top of the ANSI standard for SQL, so you will see extra bits and pieces. In your world time, it might be a bit like HTML5, HTML5, mm -hmm. and then there's extra bits and pieces. So I think Canvas, for example, wasn't in, yeah. in there and now it is. Yeah. And, and, and so you know, we will keep track of those standards. And here's an example I prepared earlier. So we can, we can use the, um, we can go and get those IDs as we need to and keep them, and keep them in sync with the wish to. Um, we've got some um, window ranking functions. Again, these are very useful, perhaps more useful in the data warehouse kind of query when you return a whole set of rows. But you can see their implication. You know, if you're designing a website and you want to see, you know, like a page of stuff, then, then this could be quite, quite important as well. Uh, this is a fairly familiar kind of um, to any normal developer that implies that DBA developers aren't normal. Let me rephrase that question. Uh, I don't even. Um, in many languages, there is a try, throw, catch kind of thing going on, and now we've got that inside the TCP language. So you can you can see the error. Sometimes we've done tests and maybe it is numeric and whatever, and sometimes those tests haven't always worked. This this is a far more sophisticated thing because it actually tries to state in itself. So if the data isn't numeric, for example, you're trying to insert um, what you think is a date into a date field. Typically, that will fail. This is going to catch those problems and allow you to have the error problem. So liking that, that's my kind of theme slide here as we go through our agenda. Uh, this is another um, completely new thing, though. 
This is giving you the ability to be able to capture a trace onto the server and then replay it multiple times, maybe against the same target for testing, for compatibility, uh, for a whole range of reasons. Um, so you, you deploy um, controllers and you deploy clients wherever you want to, it's part of the server installation when, when you do that. So you are um, licensing the SQL server to some extent to do this. Um, perhaps if I just skip to the next slide, you'll get an idea of um, how this works. Essentially, I've captured my trace file, I've done something on whatever site, uh, like a website, and on the back end, I've captured the trace file of actual statements in the database. I can then splurge that out to a whole load of uh, machines. Now, I guess these will be virtual machines, wouldn't they, Simon? Well, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that strikes me immediately about this kind of environment is you could, um, well, you can actually spin these virtual machines up on Windows Azure. So, actually, we could spin those machines up all over the world, use them to um, uh, load test against the SQL server from multiple parts of the, uh, the world. Yep, absolutely right. So, have a look at that. Pretty much obvious what it says on the tin, so some real world performance testing. I am beginning to accelerate now because I realise I've probably spent too much time talking about high availability. Yes, I'm, I'm jolly excited about uh, SQL Server 2012. System Center Advisor. System Center Advisor doesn't mention SQL Server. What's it doing on here? What is it anyway? I hear you ask. Well, I don't hear you ask because you haven't got your audio on, and I have. System Center Advisor is a bit like Operations Manager that we have. And what it essentially is is a, a, a re an everyday check of your data center to say that you're following best practice and spotting problems. The everyday check is performed by having one of your servers, and only one, with an internet connection out. It collects telemetry from your other servers, sends that data to an Azure database and an Azure application, which is what System Center Advisor is, and allows you to get back results about things that you might want to go and have a look at. So really good for that imp implementation where, say maybe here I am uh, at Global Engineer, what they actually do all these awesome training courses that actually got to the end. Um, so they can sort of run this every day and see what the hell's going on. And, and the best practice coming back is coming back real-time updated by our engineers going out and talking to customers. They spot problems, they put things up in here, and then you get a readout of what you um, It's free if you're on software assurance, so you don't have to pay for the service, you just have to install it. I've got some um, passwords on how to do that on my blog. And it will also check your AV environment and give you basic help for your Windows server as well. But what it doesn't do, which is what Ops Manager does, which does run on premise and so your data center, is give you that real time something's just gone wrong. It's telling you, giving you warnings and alerts about what has gone wrong, what could go wrong. And, and things like, you know, you're not, you're not patching or these, these databases aren't backed up. You could ignore the alerts, turn them off so you don't get, you know, a snowstorm of, of stuff. So it needs a little bit of tuning, again, like Operations Manager. So I think that's super cool. I put a few slides up here on how that works. So we kind of shows you how it's architected. So you have these agents which are connected to the internet which then talk to your data center. None of the information, well it's all private as the rest of our stuff is, we value privacy very highly. So no, you won't get a call from Microsoft saying you haven't, you're not licensed properly. And also this isn't exactly sending Microsoft at your database. No, no. It's sending, the content, it's sending you the metadata, the information about the yeah. database Server and what's actually happening on there yeah. as opposed to the information provided. Absolutely not, yeah. And obviously you're only exposing one of your um, gateway, uh, this gateway idea to the um, to the internet. Okay, so I'm just going to let that slide build and show you what's going what's going on there. So you can download this after, so you can see what's going on. And also, you can then get to that web portal from anywhere, home or what have you, and do that data. Obviously, securely. There's a whole load of certificates and so on that you create to do this. It's not just some random yeah. authentication. And you post the certificate up to advisor that you create on your machine. It's your certificate, it's your encrypted data. And this is some of the screenshots of, of what it, oh sorry, uh, there are some screenshots in here, what it looks like I've done those already. This is just talking about how do you upgrade. Although it says Super Server 2012 RC0 on here, you have an upgrade advisor, it's always a free tool. You should always put it down when you're going to do your upgrade. It gives you best practice on moving to Super Server 2012. Because hopefully by this stage of the presentation, with a couple of minutes to go, you think that. Yeah, maybe this is worth looking at. Yeah. And so this is the stuff you need to learn how to upgrade. But it also, I must say, I think we could have even the best features yet for Service 2012. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, planning your upgrade, assessment planning toolkit applies pretty well to me. Actually, Microsoft Technology. Simon and I present a lot about um, the the business of updating um, 
your environment, be that Hyper-V or what have you, does all of that. It also allows you to migrate planning from other database platforms to the Microsoft World, tell you what's out there, yeah. give you credentials, it gives you lots of nice reports. Guess what it means? It's back into the board. It's free and it also gives you lots of nice reports. You can go and wag around to your boss's nose showing you how much money you can save and what you need to buy in. And that all allows you to spec service. So very, very powerful tool for whatever Microsoft works you're doing. Absolutely. And one thing to point out about this is it's totally agentless. There's nothing to install mm -hmm. on the uh, on the yeah. endpoints in your environment. You just run this uh, remotely and yeah. gather it later. You are going to need to give some credentials to do that. Absolutely. So there's no yeah. backdoor. You're not using some secret. Stunt works, Microsoft backdoor, because there is no Microsoft stunt works. Otherwise, it would be working then, wouldn't it? Sort of? Okay, a um, couple of other things to have a look at here. Um, we talk a lot about using any old data in the SQL Server, and we've been on this road. We've got var binary. We can run the data into SQL Server databases to help save from pictures or documents, plans, whatever it happens to be. Then we, in SQL Server 2008R2, introduced the idea of file stream. Mm -hmm. And some friends of mine, um, not far from here in Woking, uh, they run a small racing car company. Uh, we had a guy called um, Lewis drives them. Yeah, yeah, Lewis Hamilton drives for them. So McLaren have an application called SQL Race, and it uses um, file stream data, unstructured binary data, to store telemetry about a lap in the race, and then that's tagged with metadata, like we're at, where is it? Monza, was it? Mm -hmm. Monza this week is lap number one, it's raining, um, and Lewis is driving, and it's car number four. That gets written to the SQL Server, and then all the telemetry about the car gets written into this file stream basis. Mm -hmm. They need to write a special API to so open all that up, and they've got a separate tool called Atlas, then, which unpicks that data and shows you all the graphs about how fast it's going, and we can maybe make a decision about what tires to use the next weekend to make sure he wins again. Mm -hmm. We didn't mention the big fans of Formula One, did we? We don't watch football, we love Formula One. Um, so, file stream is still there in SQL Server 2012, but now we've got this awesome new, weird, kind of strange thing. I say strange because let me explain what it does. Called file table. And what we can now do with searching our file stream data as an ordinary share, and people can drop, and so Sarah can drop all her PowerPoint decks, all these webinars, onto this share. And every time she drops a row and creates a folder, it's going to create a row in my SQL Server database that's underpinning it. And that row is going to contain a pointer to the metadata, the deck, or the folder name that's in there. Um, and and if I delete that row in SQL Server, if you fix the same, it will delete the file. And if Sarah deletes the file, it will delete the row. And there's some garbage collection going on to actually get rid of the file. So the table's gone and the transactions can be straight away. So if you want to back up all of Global Knowledge's presentation collateral for a course, like you could see a folder structure like this in their courses, then you can make a backup of the whole thing and you get all the metadata, all the decks, training materials, even the hands-on labs and virtual machines maybe. But if you just want to get at the files, you can. So we've got referential integrity between the database and the unstructured data that's sitting out there on shares. And that was called WinFS, I think, back in the day, wasn't it? I think it was. So this, is, this to me sounds like a really good way to start to put structure around a bunch of unstructured data and start to be able to get it into yeah. a way that we can start to query it, play with it, and you might, yeah. use it. You might just want to um, archive off web logs off your website, you know, and later on maybe do some sort of big data analysis mm -hmm. to go and actually mine that data and work out what is the customer's journey. For example, again, using Global Knowledge, I hope you don't mind keep using Global Knowledge, but it's such an obvious example. You know, how did users, what path did they go through to book up the site and certification? Where are they going? What are they doing? Understanding all that makes for a great um, website design and design experience because if it's too hard to use, they might go and can't be bothered, I'll go and go somewhere else for my services. We don't want everything. You know, so it's not even headless. You can't mind, you know. <laughs> right, so file table. Definitely worth having a look at. Mm -hmm. um, just a small point here again to reinforce what I said before. There's lots of ways to connect to SQL Server. Typically, Snack, the native client. And in, in fact, there's just another point about high availability. With, with mirroring back in the day, you used to have to have a native client to get a mirror database. With a high availability feature, all these connectors will work. And notice the one at the bottom, Hadoop. We're doing quite a lot of work with Hadoop, and perhaps one day I'll get invited back when we've got some of that a bit more out in the world. But we're working on Hadoop integration at the moment. I think we've published what we're going to do, but you can't actually try it yourself at the moment. And that's uh, an open source big data solution. What big data is, why should you care? Maybe that's a conversation for another day as well. And certainly something I might come and touch on briefly in my BI session. Um, if anybody turns up to that having listened to this one, who knows? Spinning on quickly. Right, so I've gone through about 400 miles an hour there. I'm hoping I, I, I get very excited if I speak very quickly. I'm kind of like um, broadband speed. 
Well, not my rope, but your rope. Yeah, my rope, not yours. Things you want to do. We've got some case studies on how this stuff works, so you can see what other people are doing. I think that's important. Hands on now, so you can actually go and try this without downloading it. Um, but certification best practices, definitely what you want to have a look at. And I've got some subsequent slides here on um, looking at more on high availability, um, finding out more about column store, uh, the SQL development tools that I mentioned. Juno you know is the name of the, um, the database tools before they came out, so if you're wondering what that's all about. Um, how to upgrade, how to get advice on um, replay, what um, an upgrade advisor, and a whole load of tools for that. And finding out about what we're doing about big data, there's a blog there, so you can go and look that up too. That's perhaps more than being nice, I And unstructured data, my good friend Michael Reese, uh, his blog's well worth reading on, on unstructured data, things like how to process XML and so on. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thanks for listening.